Good afternoon, everyone. As people are starting to drift back in after lunch, I, I felt I should just explain that the Somerville mayor was called away for some unanticipated emergency. Although I'm sure he would have loved to give you all more time. That had nothing to do with his uh, not being available. And I'm, I'm glad that some of the other speakers raised uh, what you all know that he was going to be talking about in their remarks in the day. Uh, he has been an advocate of safe consumption sites or supervised consumption sites and has uh, been seeking to implement one in Somerville. Uh, all right, the lights have gone down, which means that we are now going to all be facing forward again. And we're going to begin this afternoon session uh, much as we have um, had this morning uh, with a voice of lived experience. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Hanar Hernandez of the New England Addiction Technology Transfer Center at Brown University. Please come up. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Buenas tardes, can you hear me? Yes? Good afternoon. Um, thanks for the invite to present at this uh, important conference and event. I'm going to talk about recovery processes grounded in social justice. Um, my name is Janet Hernandez, and I am Puerto Rican. I'm Puerto Rican. I've lived in Massachusetts for the last 50 years. And yes, I, have, uh, I earned a PhD. I'm a certified prevention specialist and I am certified and licensed as a drug and alcohol counselor, but I also have a GED, and my GED I got in prison. And it was more difficult to get a GED in prison than to get a PhD out in the real world, right? Out here, it was more difficult to do that. And as we talk about stigma and think about how to deal with stigma, um, one way is to use data that bores people to death. Another way is to talk about personal stories that bring people into the fold and give hope to people who are still um, mired in using substances across the country and here in Massachusetts. So we have a responsibility to do that and to do it well. Um, so I'm a person in long-term recovery, and what that means for me is that I haven't used a drug in the last 32 years. And I am, I am happy to say that I am a billionaire. Um, I have a billion seconds in recovery. It's the only time that I'll be able to say that I'm a billionaire. Um, but know that I worked in the field, I've worked in the field for 31 years, going on 32. Someone gave me an opportunity to work in this field when I just had that GED and I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and I was, I was taken aback because I said, these people are crazy. They gave me a job. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't think they know what they're doing. The piece in that story is that someone believed in me more than what I believed in myself. And we have a responsibility to do that with each and every person who needs help in our country, and in our state, in our communities, in our agencies, in our neighborhoods. And I can't say um, that we always do that. I think that there's too much finger waving and finger pointing at people. Um, we say that we understand the disease of addiction, but many times our response is riddled with stigma and a lack of understanding of what addiction is. So I worked in the field for 10 years with my GED, and, um, and I sat in rooms uh, such as this, feeling inadequate and not um, brave enough to speak up, because many of you, many of us, many of um, lead with, well, let me answer that because I have a PhD, or let me answer that because I have a master's degree, let me answer that because I know this because I work here. And the people who have a contribution to make in our country, people in recovery who might not have had access to the types of education institutions such as this one and others, have the same fears that I had, that I continue to have, that we need to make these spaces welcoming for those people. I can't tell you how many people called me and said, you're going to be speaking there? You're, you're going to be speaking at that conference? I would like to go, but I don't know if that's a conference for me. You see the message that we sent to, to many people who need access to this type of conversation. I'm a person who talks a lot, so I have 11 minutes and 31 seconds left. <laughs> 
I might say some things that are, that are definitely going to make some people feel uncomfortable. And what I, what I say to you is when you feel uncomfortable, good. Because nothing has ever changed in this country or all over the world unless we make people feel uncomfortable. Nothing ever changed in my life unless I was uncomfortable. And if you feel uncomfortable, find someone to give you a hug, find someone right to speak to, that sort of thing. And then remember this, there are people today who just learned that someone died. There are people today who are planning a funeral. There are people today who are putting people into the ground. There are people today who are celebrating a birthday without their loved one with them. So if you feel uncomfortable, imagine what they feel. And then deal with it that way, right? Because if I feel uncomfortable, I, I, at the end of the day, I go home, right? But the people that we're talking about, the issues that we're talking about, are that serious for me. And so there's some people in the room who are going to find validation in what I say because some of the stuff that I say is not traditionally spoken of in spaces and places like this. And so history and context matters. It matters for what we do, and it matters that we look backwards so that we don't continue to repeat, continue to repeat some of the same mistakes that we're repeating today. And so we know a great deal that we have created silos. Our system of care is riddled with silos. We have mental health in one area. We have health in another area. We have human services somewhere else. We have addiction services or substance use disorder services somewhere else. And many times they're in the same building and people don't talk to each other. And we have a responsibility to address those silos and to do something differently. We have a responsibility to do that with policy, with actions, with behaviors, with our words. And we need to speak to these issues out loud because the people who come to us, they are whole individuals. And we have developed systems and we recreate systems that are fragmented and treat people frag in a fragmented way. You have a mental health issue, go over here. You have a substance use issue, go over here. And then these people don't do well speaking to each other. There are models to follow that we are breaking down silos. But we're not there yet. And we shouldn't celebrate or pat ourselves on the back thinking that we're there. We're not quite there yet. The other thing is that our field has traditionally utilized punitive measures to treat substance use disorders. And we can't get away from that. And we continuously need to look at what that looks like, right? So funding, most of the funding for substance use disorders goes to what? Goes to treatment, right? It goes to treatment. Do we fund prevention? Yes. Do we fund it the way that we need to fund prevention? No, if you have kids and you're sitting in this audience, you want your kids never to have to need treatment, right? And so communities want that too. And we need to fund the entire continuum, prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery supports, not just one portion of it. The other thing is that we have a flawed design. In as far as I'm concerned and what some of the research says, we have a flawed design in terms of how we um, roll out services and for whom and how are they designed. That sort of thing. We have a system that was designed for primarily white heterosexual males. That is problematic if you are a female, if you are a female with kids, if you are a female that's monolingual, if you are a female with kids, monolingual and is gay, lesbian, where do we go? Where do we send people? There's a flaw in our design in terms of how we do things. And many times we're replicating those designs in ways that have disproportionate impacts in our communities. If people have relapsed in our field, traditionally we've kicked them out. And if you notice, I don't have traditional slides. My slides are nothing like maybe you saw this morning or anything else that you see in the afternoon. <laughs> I can do those types of slides too, and I, I do them, but not here. And so when people exhibit signs and symptoms of their disease, we have kicked them out of treatment. We still do that to this day. I meet people every day in my community and across the state and across the country. And they said, you know what, someone kicked me out. I just met someone who said, I was a recovery coach and they told me that I can't be because I don't have two years in continuous recovery. But I have 18 months, Hanir. A person with a huge heart with something to give back. We have a flawed design in how we treat our people, how we treat our people within the workforce, and how we treat people walking through the door in need of services, or most of the people who are coerced into our system. The other thing is that we have locked people up. And that is a disgrace. And we should be appalled by that behavior. But it's not only that. We need to dive deeper. We have criminalized, we have criminalized 
pigmentation of the skin, texture of the hair, accent, and all of those behaviors. We must never forget that we are in that space. We are in that space where my brothers and sisters are sitting right now in Concord, in Framingham, in Walpole, in all of these states and county jails across the country and here in Massachusetts, serving time, and the majority of them have a substance use disorder, and over 50% of them have a mental health issue. So we have criminalized health. And we should speak about that out loud and up front. It's not enough to just mention an opioid crisis. So we have mass incarceration. 1970, there were 200,000 people incarcerated in the US. And right now, we have 2.3 million people incarcerated in the US, disproportionate number of African Americans and blacks, Native Americans and Latinos, and poor whites. And so something is happening within the system that we don't talk a great deal about. There's a lot of research and some talk about it, but where are the policies, where are the practices in relationship to these issues? And do we have an opioid crisis? That is the question. Some of you might say, yes, we do, and I say, no, we don't. When, you, when we have a myopic view of what the crisis is, then our policies are myopic in solutions. And so we have a crisis in the criminal justice system. We have a crisis with substance use disorders that goes above and beyond just opioids. See, we have people using methamphetamines. We have people dying from alcoholism. We have people, right, with all kinds of substances. We have a crisis in health. We have a crisis in education. We have a crisis in mental health. We have a crisis with affordable housing at the community level, with employment opportunities, and we should be comprehensive when we talk about what the crisis is, as opposed to talking about just one piece of the crisis. Because when we focus on one thing, then we get what we get. Why do we declare a crisis now? And some of you will feel uncomfortable when I say this. We have a crisis now because young white kids from the suburbs are dying. And that's why we declared a crisis. But in the communities that I come from, we've been living in a perpetual crisis for decades. And what we've gotten, instead of a conversation about treatment and prevention, is prisons and jails and punitive measures. And if you wonder why the audience looks the way it looks, it's because of how we do things and how we talk about things and our failure to be honest with ourselves in terms of what's happening. And our failure to look back and understand and look forward to understand what we've done for people who look like me, who speak like me, who end up in prisons and jails when what they need, the only reason why I'm standing here with you today is because I got treatment. We need a process of humanization. Pla Paulo Freire talked about the process of humanization. We need to wrestle back our humanity because we have been robbed of our humanity. And I would argue that each and every one of us in this room has been exposed to dehumanization in relationship to substance use disorders and mental health and other health conditions in the country. And if you don't believe me, when you leave here today, you're gonna come up at a street light and you're gonna see people with a sign. And that sign is gonna say, we'll work for food. Homeless veteran. I saw one interestingly the other day that says, need money for weed and pizza. <laughs> I'm like, oh shit, he got it right. Forgive my language. He got it right, right? You smoke some weed, you get the munchies, you want some pizza. <laughs> and at that person, we have a different attitude than the person who stands there without a leg who says, I'm a veteran. Why is it different? Because we have been dehumanized. We talk about, we're not biased, I'm not biased. I'm not judgmental. Um, I treat others the way that I want to be treated, and I treat everybody the same. All of that is a crock of shit. <laughs> we are extremely biased individuals, human beings are. We are highly biased, and if you're sitting in this room and saying, I'm not biased, you are, you're just judging a lot of people, or, or, or you're judgmental, I'm not, you're judging a lot of people, then you're judging me too. Because either you agree with what I'm saying, or you disagree, and that's a judgment. And we shouldn't be treating people the same. You are not the same as 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 you, and so forth. I have no business. It sounds good, right? It sounds good to say that we treat everybody the same, but we shouldn't. We have a lot of similarities, but we have a lot of different needs as well. We need to fund, we need to fund a true public health approach. The entire continuum, prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery supports, and not just one thing. We need to be strength-based in our approach to these issues. 
We need to be trauma informed, but we also need to be social justice informed. Let us never forget that the, the data that the commissioner of Massachusetts presented, right, talks about disproportionate impact. African Americans and blacks are dying at disproportionate numbers in the state. Latinos and Native Americans are dying at disproportionate numbers. And when we have a myopic view of what the crisis is, we come up with policies that are myopic and we feed disparities in our country and in our commonwealth. We have a responsibility to address this in a different way. And that includes the multiple pathways of recovery. You know what is the most talked about pathway right now? It's been talked about at this conference nonstop. Medication-assisted treatment, medication-assisted recovery. And many people are talking about it like that's the, the, the thing for everybody. Medication-assisted treatment for everybody. Medication-assisted treatment works. And I know plenty of people where that works, but it, that is just one pathway of many, many. Most people get better, if you read research, most people get better even without treatment. And so we have holistic approaches. We have exercise and recovery. We have faith-based in recovery. We have medication-assisted treatment and recovery. And we also have harm reduction at our disposal. And if you cannot support any one of those pathways, just get out of the way and let someone who can do that work and do it well. But don't be an obstructionist getting in the way and saying, oh, we shouldn't have safe injection sites in Massachusetts. Why? Are you, are you going to use them? No? Then get out the way. Because I know plenty of people who can use them. I know plenty of people who can use them. We need criminal justice reform in this country and in this state. And it's not a just, just about criminal justice reform. We also need restorative justice. Right now, the last data that I read, Massachusetts, about 200 million made from the sale of marijuana. The people profiting for that, from that are by and large white heterosexual males. While my people sit in Walpole, Framingham, and all of the county jails across the state, across the country, for the same marijuana that is now legal to sell. But our people get to sell, sit in those jails doing time. We have a responsibility to speak to truth to power and to do something about that, right? I just got the, the, the time and I'm over time, but I just have one more slide. This one. Our workforce should look like the people who are walking through the door. Right now, it's majority baby boomer, retiring, and white. The majority of the people walking through the door are young, dynamic, and very diverse. And so we need a workforce that is reflective of the people walking through the door if we're to get the results that we want, right? So I, I crammed a lot of things into 15 minutes and I'm over, but we need to ground our work in social justice. There is no other way to do this as far as I'm concerned. And I am sick and tired of going to spaces and places where people are not acknowledging what is right in front of us. And if we want to lead with data, there's plenty of data on disparities and what that means. And in my house, we are as healthy as the sickest person in the house. And if you have kids, you know what that means. That if you wake up in the morning and your kid is sick and you woke up feeling really good, as soon as you find out that your kid is sick, you're not that happy anymore. And I think we can do multiple things at the same time. We should treat the most vulnerable populations amongst us and then everybody gets better. And not just think about certain people as an afterthought. I thank you again for inviting me. And thank you for um, listening. Look, you got to turn around. All right, then. I guess you liked his slides. <laughs> Uh, that, that was wonderful, and, and now we're going to move on to the next panel. Can I ask you just to start taking your places as, you, uh, as we move into the next session? Uh, this is our second panel of the day, uh, and we are now going to be discussing uh, something that's really relevant to the conversation that we just had, uh, stigma and enforcement and punishment. It's my great pleasure to introduce... Uh, Dr. Uh, Kimberlin, I'm looking for my notes, Kimberlin. I'm, I know you, but I don't know your many titles. Here we go. Uh, Dr. Kimberlin Leary, uh, who is an associate professor of psychology at the Harvard Medical School, 
and a associate professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management. Uh, we've recorded some podcasts that are still getting finalized, but we had a great one together. It's my pleasure to turn it over to you and to ask you to introduce the panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. So let me begin by first thanking Dr. Hernandez for inviting us to get uncomfortable. And I hope that same spirit uh, continues through this panel where we really hope to have a lot of engagement with all of you as well. So let me begin also by thanking Dean Williams and Dr. Bassett for really creating this venue to elevate this conversation and for creating an opportunity for us to ask provocative questions of one another. And as a proud graduate of both the University of Michigan, where I got my PhD, and Harvard's Kennedy School, I'm also thrilled that this is an inter-university collaboration. And I think it, 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 just the fact of that it sends a message that in order to make progress, we're really going to have to think about how we bring different systems together, how we cross those silos, and how we begin to build on different resources. And over the, the lunchtime break, I took a moment just to remind myself of what stigma really means by, as a good academic, looking up the definition. So here are a couple of things that maybe you know and maybe you don't know. First, when you look at the dictionary definition of stigma, typically it refers to a mark of disgrace that's associated with circumstance, a quality, or person. We all know that part. It's in the medical field, as many of you may know, it's a mark of a disease, a sign of a disease. But in certain religious traditions, in the Christian tradition, it also refers to the marks that were left on the body of Jesus. And when one experiences a stigma or a stigmata, it's a sign of divine favor. And if you go further into botany, uh, which the dictionary led me, um, it turns out that stigma refers to that part of the pistil that receives pollination, or the pollen during pollination. So I mention all of this to say that when we look broadly at stigma, there are a couple things we may want to keep in mind. The first is that when we deconstruct stigma, when we analyze it, when we interrogate it, when we get uncomfortable about what it tells us about ourselves and our society, there's an opportunity to really undo that mark of disgrace. But in that definition of stigma is also this idea of generativity and growth. And that's what we have to keep in mind today. So, to that end, our goal is to move from public health and health, which we already have done by virtue of, a, of the artwork outside and uh, beginning with a keynote by a historian, to now talk about other systems that are critical to this conversation on stigma, namely criminal justice, law enforcement, and harm reduction. So let me introduce my four colleagues very briefly because their long bios are in the program. And then we'll follow the same format as before. Each will have about seven or eight minutes to make a presentation. Then we will have some conversation and interchange among the panelists. And then we will open things up to you and have an interactive discussion. So uh, Dr. and Professor Leo Beletsky is our first presenter. He has joint appointments at Northwestern University in both the School of Law and the College of Health Sciences. He also directs the School of Law's Health Injustice Action Lab. Lieutenant De Detective Patrick Glynn is a 34-year 34 34 veteran, 34 veteran of the Quincy Police Department and the commander of the Special Investigations and Narcotics Unit. He's also an adjunct faculty member at Eastern Nazarene College and he is a founding member of the Norfolk County Prescription Drug Monitoring Program and director of the Quincy Naloxone Program. Mr. Gary Langus is an independent drug policy professional and a longtime harm reduction specialist. He is the founder and president of Frontliner Consulting, a role that he held uh, until just recently, but for over 13 years. And finally, Professor Barbara McQuaid is from the University of Michigan, where she teaches criminal law, criminal procedure, and national security law. 
She was appointed by President Barack Obama to serve as the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan, where her office brought cases involving public corruption, terrorism, drug trafficking, and civil rights. So with that, let me turn it over to the panelists. Thanks so much for that introduction and for inviting me here for this timely and important discussion. Um, let's see. How do I advance the slides? Uh, okay, sorry, there we go. So uh, <clears throat> the benefit of going um, later in the day is that uh, some of the things that I wanted to mention have already been mentioned, and uh, that saves us time. Uh, <clears throat> but I wanted to just, again, um, harp on this theme that's already been touched upon, which is that language is really important, and it drives um, the language that we use and the narratives that we use to talk about problems drives the solutions. Um, so uh, from my point of view, my lens is uh, essentially as a, uh, a law and public health researcher um, looking at the overdose crisis and making the connections through interdisciplinary perspectives onto um, the language that's used and the issues that, um, that drive this problem. And even though We've, been, we've talked about the fact that um, you know, words such as abuse and um, others are stigmatizing. There are actually very clear parallels between stigmatization and criminalization. So words like abuse, for example, have very clear uh, roots in criminal law. So we talk about child abuse, spousal abuse, um, and so forth, and so by using these words, we're clearly making a link between um, addiction and substance use to criminalization. And um, maybe the overarching framework for my talk in general is that criminalization and stigma are really closely intertwined. In fact, criminalization is stigmatization. It's a normative statement that that a society makes about what it considers to be um, a criminal behavior, a behavior that should be stigmatized. And so you can't have a conversation about destigmatization without talking about decriminalization because that's one and the same. And if you're trying to address, if you're trying to advance uh, destigmatization without um, talking about criminal law, um, you're missing a huge piece of the puzzle. I think another um, element that I wanted to mention is um, kind of a, a complicated relationship between trying to advance destigmatization of addiction um, through a brain disease model. So the brain disease model of addiction, which has already been talked about, is one of the ways in which um, healthcare professionals have um, sort of seized upon and try to advance the conversation saying, you know, this is a disease we should approach it as such, um, which is something that is certainly valuable, but I think requires a little bit of a critical perspective because once you, um, uh, you have to be very nuanced and careful so that a brain disease model does not become a way of um, essentially taking agency and taking um, competency away from people who have uh, the, uh, who are affected by addiction because in a legal, in a legal realm, that means that um, coercive and involuntary approaches then enter the picture. So uh, I'll talk about that in a second. And then the third thing that I really quickly wanted to mention is that in many ways, if you're trying to use punishment, whether it's in the criminal justice system or in the healthcare system as a way of moderating the behavior of people with addiction, you're missing the clinical definition of addiction because one of the key elements of the disease of addiction is um, approaching um, issues, uh, continuing compulsive use despite negative consequences. So if you're trying to use negative consequences 
to influence the behavior of people with addiction, you're missing the entire definition. And then uh, Dr. Wakeman already mentioned the Changing Narrative um, Initiative, which uh, has a lot more information about um, these particular elements. So very quickly, I wanted to uh, talk about the role of law and law enforcement in this conversation about stigma. The, as much as law codifies stigmatization, its enforcement also, the, the way that the law is enforced also can shape um, and, and be an expression of stigma. So for example, um, the way that we enforce law to make our systems equal and um, uh, sort of addressing addiction in the way that we address other physical and mental health issues, um, the law is not actually being enforced. So we have good law, uh, we have positive law, and we are not enforcing it. Um, the um, issue of um, uh, coverage of healthcare coverage for addiction treatment is one of the one of the elements of this. So um, the Center for Addiction, uh, Lindsay Volo, who is here, who is a former student, has done really great work where she, uh, the Center for Addiction has demonstrated that um, essentially parity requirements are not being enforced even though they're codified in law. Um, the other element that I wanted to quickly mention is that law enforcement, even though we talk about the fact that you know, we're now kind of approaching it from a public health standpoint, um, the law that codifies addiction um, from a criminal justice perspective is still very much alive and well. So this graph um, demonstrates the enforcement and uh, prosecution of drug-induced homicide, which is essentially um, when someone dies, um, the law law enforcement goes after the person who distributes drugs and, and charges them with murder, homicide, or involuntary manslaughter. And so these prosecutions have been skyrocketing, um, really challenging this idea that we're taking a public health approach. We're very much still very much reliant on uh, criminal justice punitive approaches. And the folks who are prosecutors, uh, prosecuted under these laws typically are friends, partners, co-users are not really um, the kinds of people that you imagine would be prosecuted, which is, you know, sort of drug kingpins. And there's um, major racial disparities in who, um, who is prosecuted and who receives uh, longer sentences uh, based on these prosecutions. The, um, another element from our research is the rise in voluntary commitment, which again goes back to this idea that we're taking a public health approach um, in fact, a lot of the policy emphasis on treatment is transferred through this punishment lens, the idea that punishment is therapeutic, um, to uh, involuntarily commit people for substance use. Here in Massachusetts, for example, we commit um, over 6,000 people a year, and this is typically done in um, context of criminal justice settings. So these folks are committed in, in basically jails um, that are rebranded as treatment facilities. And, and so we have to really challenge the idea that coercion and involuntary commitment is therapeutic for the purpose of substance use treatment. And then finally, I wanted to end on this note, which is um, we have to essentially uh, address this issue from a harm reduction perspective on the individual level, but also on a policy level, in the sense that um, ideally we want criminal justice contact and encounters to be uh, as small part of um, the recovery process as possible. We want to deflect um, and divert people from the criminal justice system. But we have to accept the world as it is and not as it should be. And so currently there are a lot of encounters both with officers and with um, uh, correctional settings. So we have to re reframe those encounters from a source of harm to a source of benefit. And this is where uh, programs such as um, law enforcement uh, administration of naloxone, treatment inside correctional facilities, and all these efforts are really important. We have to keep our eye on the prize of um, really minimizing the contact that people have with the criminal justice system. Um, and, and also, uh, just uh, finish on a, a sort of a critical perspective, which is that um, thinking about um, law enforcement sort of pathways to recovery and to treatment um, has to take into account 
the history of trauma and um, uh, sort of uh, an adversarial relationship that some communities have with law enforcement. And so um, the idea that you, know, you need to walk through the doors of a police department to get access to treatment uh, has a lot of um, uh, play right now and is applauded and it should be applauded in some ways, but in other ways we also have to realize that some people are never going to be, feel comfortable walking through the doors of a police department to get help. So it's really important to make sure to um, uh, center systems of care in, in therapeutic ways and not in ways that um, sort of recriminalize people or force them to go through uh, systems that have traumatized them in the past. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. We spoke a little bit about being uncomfortable earlier. I think I'm the only police officer here, but I probably don't feel as uncomfortable as some of you being in patriot territory, like Dr. Bassett from New York and a few other people. So we, we share that, okay? Uh, I kind of look at myself as a law enforcement practitioner with a very large practice, and people come to us voluntarily. So as, as we go through some of the slides that I have here, it's how does a drug change a life, a community, and a society, and how did we get to that point? And let me see if I get the right button. Okay, good. We have five pillars that we go by in the city of Quincy. Prevention, education, treatment, enforcement, absolutely. We're out to enforce the laws against the drug traffickers, and we know that the people that have an issue need some other avenue, not assault. They need to get out of the criminal justice system and go into some type of treatment. And through our district attorney's office, Michael Morrissey, Norfolk County, we've had numerous programs. One is called the Biodiversion Program. So when we disrupt an organization, we know that there are people that are gonna be looking for their next source. That's gonna be inconsistent, and that's gonna be the time that there's prevalent for an overdose and possibly a fatal overdose. So we go back and we look for the customers, which we know, they're all local, and we give them a card. And they have that card Excuse me for people not from Boston, sometimes I lose my R, okay? <laughs> they, we give them that card and they can go to a service called Bay State Community Services for a tailor-made program for themselves and there's nothing hanging over their head. So I kind of think of ourselves or myself as a representative, probably one of the largest harm reduction responder groups called the police. Uh, we just don't use that word sometimes, those two words, harm reduction, but we practice it every single day. And our R is obviously for recovery, to reduce the deaths, and we know this is going to be relapse, and we want to re-enter the community. We want that person to re-enter the community. And we have various programs for that also. And I kind of have this up here, and it's kind of good that we're here after lunch because people have to focus and say, are those things really spinning? <laughs> yes, they are. Uh, the, one of the biggest portions is, is obviously law enforcement knock, knock in and uh, the locks on out on the street, excuse me. Back in 2009, Quincy was a pilot program with the Department of Public Health here in Massachusetts. We trained all our officers and we deployed it out on the street and it made an incredible impact. There was a lot of negativity at first. People didn't think police should be administering that medication. As time went on, the entire perception of the police changed. That's 2009, 2008, 2009. We're talking 10, 11 years ago. This is really cutting edge, and I don't like to use that term. But for police to be delivering a medication, we saw that change. And what we want to do is get them to the hospital alive, get them into a treatment facility, a secondary facility. And now we conduct home visits. They're called leave behind. There's a lot of different things. We call them home safety visits, post-overdose visits. We go with some outreach workers, two police officers, and a clinician. And we leave material for counseling, and it's for both the family and the individual that overdosed because they have to heal together. And we also train them in Narcan and leave Narcan. And we've been pretty successful. We've had four or five additional reversals with the Narcan that was left in the house. So we, we call that a very successful operation. We've done close to 400 of them and we've been able to get into the home almost 97% of the time in order to deliver this extra uh, medication, obviously the naloxone, along with information that family members who have been living with this have never known was out there. They never knew that there was help for them. And that's coming from the police. That's like, wow, police do that? Uh, the next thing is we know the fentanyl. Obviously, Dr. Rao went through this earlier. Uh, the percentages of fentanyl being mixed in with the deaths 
Uh, we're seeing an uh, incredible amount of fentanyl actually taking the place of heroin. It's also being mixed and sprinkled in marijuana. It's being put into cocaine, and also now we're having a surge of methamphetamine. And people will go, I only do cocaine. I don't do that other stuff. Well, Narcan, naloxone reversed you. It was an opiate in there. It turns out it's fentanyl. Uh, so people are not aware of what's out on the street. And we're bringing that to them. Just a little bit, little thing here, the financial cost of an overdose. Uh, we have the, kind of the stagnant cost of what it costs for two officers to arrive in a cruiser and so forth. Uh, same as a fire department, or what it actually costs for a fire to disperse. Now, whether some communities have a split tier, we have a split tier, we have a private ambulance company, Brewster Ambulance, that services our city. So there's an ambulance cost and the fire service cost, and then obviously the cost for the hospital. And if we take a look at that phenomenal number at the bottom, and it does fluctuate here and there by community, but it's very significant. If we can get people into treatment through our biodiversion program and through various other aspects, we're going to save a lot of money. And we take that funding and bring it into the treatment side and counseling. Because as a great congressman once said, if there's no uh, vision without funding is a hallucination. And that's what we want to get away from. So this is a very busy slide. I, I understand. I'm sorry for it. But it gives a little bit of the stats they talked about earlier as far as our home visits go, uh, the resources we leave, the training in the naloxone, I, I think is one of our um, flagship enter, enter items in this whole program is because I don't believe other programs do that involving the police, and we want them to heal together and get them back into society. And we see reduction in collateral crime, as I call it, purse snatching, house breaks, car breaks. We see that go down when people go into treatment because they're not looking for funds to go out and purchase drugs. And how did we get the officers on board? Well, we got them on board because we changed their mindset. We started looking at this as an individual, okay, as instead of just someone that's out there. This is a problem, there's no doubt. And the stigma involved with it here is a great story. One Christmas, I got a package at the police station. It came in, it was nicely wrapped. I said to one of my detectives, I said, go down one floor into another office and open that for me, will you please? So I didn't know what was gonna be in it. So he did, he came back up, he showed it to me, it was a pair of pajamas and a note, and it was from Brad. Someone I had arrested a number of times in the past. It said, thank you, thinking of you during the Christmas season for all you've done for me. And it was almost like opposite day. He had turned the corner, and that was his epiphany, that we were on the same side of helping people. So I looked at the pajamas, and they were beautiful. They were very high end. <laughs> but down on the leg of the bottoms, there was this yellow, beige metallic tag. You know the security device that you can't leave the store with? <laughs> so one could gather how he got it out of the store. So I didn't know what to do with it, so I did the right thing. I went back to Macy's, they took the tag off, and I regifted. But the point of that story is that the stigma was removed between us. It's no longer them and us. It's no longer the warrior and the guardian. It's people. It's people. And we need to know that. And as we go through this, I hope that we can come to that point because there are many programs out there. The stigma of the police, law enforcement, as I said, I'm just a law enforcement practitioner with a large practice. And people can come to me, or sometimes I go to them. Uh, but when they leave my office, they don't go into a cell. They go into some type of treatment, hopefully. Thank you. I don't have any uh, show for you, no slides, so uh, you're going to have to listen to me. Um, my name is Gary Landis. I've been working um, with folks um, practicing harm reduction strategies for close to 30 years. Um, I've researched opioid use for more than 50 years, uh, starting uh, 1967. Um, and um, it's been quite the journey. Uh, you know, my research consisted of going to New York three, four times a week to do what I had to do down in New York uh, as a 17, 18 year old. And um, I came back and um, something that I thought was just gonna be a temporary phase I was going through lasted for many decades. And um, you know, I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to 
still have my pulse with me. Um, you know, I witness a lot, like I describe myself as a witness and a researcher and a historian of opioids. Um, you know, I've researched just about every aspect of um, opioids or heroin that you want to, you know, you can think of. Um, and Lieutenant, like, you know, like I'm going to say some things, right, that um, the statutes of limitations may be, um, I, I'm sure, are up. <laughs> so, and we thank you, sir. Yeah, so like most of, the, most of my, most of my uh, experience uh, after, after like really dipping in and, and doing the hands-on experience with opioids, um, uh, starting to work with folks who use drugs, um, started like 30 years ago. And, um, you know, it was because of uh, watching friends that I had. I hadn't um, been using, uh, you know, any heroin for a while back then. And uh, then I started to watch some of my friends um, disappear in front of me from this disease that they described, you know, in, in horrific ways was, uh, you know, HIV had come on the scene in the 80s. And um, my family and friends, um, a lot of them, have gone on from, you know, having the virus. So, so that's, what inter that's what got me to, um, to st I was like into making, you know, like I wanted to become rich and be retired down in Key West someplace. Uh, that was supposed to happen 20 years ago. It never, never took shape. But um, I started doing some volunteer work around that time, you know, and uh, it was mentioned before ACT UP and, and the, uh, the AIDS Brigade, the first folks, you know, some of the first folks that, that started giving out uh, syringes. And, and in my case, it was like, it was a, an orderly, I think, or somebody from uh, one of the large medical centers that caught me using down in the, down in the basement of the hospital, and he, and he asked me um, if I wanted some clean, sterile syringes, and that was in like 1986, I believe. And that was my first introduction. So when I started doing the volunteer work around HIV prevention, I um, hooked up with a lot of folks doing syringe exchange. And, and that's what we did for a long time until uh, 1993 when they, they, um, they had four programs, I believe, needle exchange programs in Massachusetts. But there were still other communities like Lynn, Lawrence, Lowell, Revere, Saugus, Gloucester, you know, all of those cities. I come from the North Shore, and they didn't have, they were in the wrong zip code to protect themselves from HIV. So we formed an organization, and we started doing syringe access and syringe exchange, um, all, all different kinds of models, like home delivery and things like that. And um, uh, even though they had needle exchanges in Massachusetts, you know, all of us that worked for that group probably about 90% of us were arrested. Um, I was put on trial, um, that lasted three days, found not guilty, uh, real, you, you know, and I just, you know, I said, how can they put me in jail for trying to save somebody's life? Because I had gone through the, I had gone through losing my wife, you know, I had to tell my teenage children that their mom was gone one morning, and that was horrible, like I didn't, you know, like that's not what, um, I had planned my life to be, and um, you know, it's it's so I had to do something, and I made that commitment that you're gonna you're gonna do this work until there's no more HIV infection, and um, that was my commitment back then. And I've carried on and, and continued to do that stuff with a group of advocates that and, and activists that like have blown me away and taught me so much. I've had so many great teachers in this life, and. Um, like one was um, a gentleman from Chicago and we were down in Miami in the 90s and he was telling me one of the initiatives he was doing was naloxone distribution to uh, persons who use drugs. I said, well, that's great. I said, you know, I can't get any naloxone up there. And, uh, and so, so we made a deal like, you know, it was, um, it was like something like the Boston Buyers Club, but I'd ship to uh, Chicago and I'd get boxes and crates of uh, naloxone. I can remember one time we used to have it delivered to uh, a little cabin in Ipswich, and um, and uh, I can remember the police directing the traffic as the truck was trying to get down the street. And I'm saying, if they only knew there were like you know like 400,000 syringes and naloxone on there, you know. Um, but we did that stuff for for a while, and uh, with the naloxone we did it for seven years, 
uh, until the uh, city of Boston um, started their own program using some of our data, uh, using some of the, um, the intake forms that we had at the time, the enrollment forms, and they said I wanted in, in, Boston, in Boston and in Cambridge. And that went on for a year until the uh, commissioner um, at the time was, I'm going to forget, John Auerbach, that's correct. Thank you, Michael. I know that's your voice. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and he started eight programs, and one of them was a place where I was working, so they funded us to do it. And it was all legal now. So everything I had you know, done and my crew did before that, you know, like we were like, it was all legal now. The fun was gone, you know? <laughs> And then I, then I started to meet folks like, you know, Lieutenant Glenn and, and, uh, and Captain Piccarillo uh, from the Revere Fire Department talking about how we can get the locks on, on onto his fire units. And, uh, you know, that was a big thing in the 2009, 2010. I think they started in 2010, a little after Quincy. And, um, you know, like I've really come to enjoy working with law enforcement. And these were the folks that chased me around when I was researching drugs. They chased me around when I was like trying to prevent disease and death. Um, you know, like I felt like I was harassed. And, um, and now I've been working with uh, law enforcement since then, you know, about 2007 or so. And, uh, and, I, and I love doing it, you know. And, um, you know, it's gone from doing those post overdose door knocks to, um, you know, now I meet with the officers and the outreach team about trauma. You know, we have a, a meeting before. We go out and then we have a debriefing when we come back and we talk about trauma. We have law enforcement and us, we have the same customers. And, um, you know, when I first started working in that setting, there were a lot of um, junky talk, stuff like that. But, you know, like Lieutenant brought out, culture started to change inside the departments I was working in. And that really it just gave me a good feeling. And we, um, I think we work together now, and I continue to do that today. You know, I work with a lot of law enforcement uh, organizations, and I work with harm reduction folks. And there's a, you know, we, what I try to focus on, that focus on what we have in common, not our differences, because, like, I have a lot of differences with a lot of people, you know. And if I stay on those differences, um, I'm in trouble, and the people I'm trying to serve are in trouble. So I feel like by focusing on that, just our similarities, what we have in common, we can come up and we can do some good things. And I'm really excited what's happening in Massachusetts now with some of the new uh, funding that's coming into the state. I'm glad, you know, like I, it's great to look around the country and see how, how this has grown. And um, I just look forward to tomorrow and see what that brings. Um, and uh, thanks for um, inviting me today. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. good afternoon. Dr. Leary and Dr. Bromet, thanks so much for the invitation to be here today. Um, I, uh, I, I feel a little bit uh, in the minority with my colleague from the law enforcement community as a fellow veteran of the world of law enforcement. Um, and when I come to conferences like this, uh, I am struck by the extent to which medical professionals blame themselves for the opioid epidemic. We heard this point earlier about this Catholic guilt, like it's inherently bad to prescribe opioids. Um, you know, we lawyers, we never feel guilt. It's, it's a trait of the profession. Where it's trained out of us. You, you healthcare people are adorable with your guilt. <laughs> but it, it's actually important to recognize that legitimate medical providers are not at fault here because of some of the points made here earlier today, Dr. Legacetti talked about this, that some of the limits that we are putting on access to pain prescriptions are causing harm to patients who need it and can't get it. We're stopping legitimate doctors from doing the work they need to do because there are illegitimate doctors who are breaking the rules to uh, abuse patients. And let me tell you something. They don't have guilt either. If they're violating the first rules, they're not going to worry about violating the secondary rules. Um, one of the stigmas, I think, that faces the medical profession is this notion 
that doctors have caused the opioid epidemic by overprescribing medication. Um, now, certainly, we have seen a time in history when legitimate doctors may have unwittingly uh, prescribed uh, opioids and contributed to the start of addiction, but I don't think they are the ones to blame for this epidemic. Instead, there's a group of people who deliberately exploit addiction to make money. These are the real culprits, and these are the people we do need to, for, to, to train our sights on in law enforcement. I know there's been a lot of talk about decriminalizing uh, opioids and uh, decoupling treatment and, uh, and, and law enforcement, and that may be true when it comes to users of drugs. But criminal law, in my view, is all about stopping powerful people from preying on vulnerable people. And that is what is driving the opioid epidemic. I attribute it to three factors, three drivers that are pushing the opioid epidemic. In my work as U.S. Attorney in Detroit, we found that, it, number one, it was a small percentage of doctors who are nothing more than criminals with a medical license working out of pill mills. Two, street trafficking organizations who switched from cocaine and other drugs because they found it more lucrative and less heavily penalized to distribute pills than it was to distribute other traditional street drugs. And finally, drug manufacturers who know exactly what they're selling and putting out there and they're profiting from it. Let me talk about each one of those briefly in turn. Um, at the federal level, we are not so interested in prosecuting the user of drugs. Uh, we, uh, we utilize the scarce resources of the federal government to go after drug trafficking organizations. And at the federal level, a big group of drug traffickers are these corrupt doctors who set up pill mills and use their medical license to divert medicines to people who are abusing them. A big focus of our work was Medicare fraud. Medicare fraud costs taxpayers $52 billion a year, and it's committed by these corrupt doctors who are submitted fraudulent billing uh, to the Medicare program to increase their own profits. And in recent years, Law enforcement has been able to detect a lot of this by using data. It used to be we would sit back and wait for whistleblowers and cooperating defendants to tell us about people who were diverting medicines and fraudulently billing Medicare. But in recent years, agents at the FBI and Health and Human Services have access to data that shows who the outliers are when it comes to um, providing certain treatments or certain tests or prescribing certain drugs. And one of the correlations they found is that those who are the, the highest prescribers of opioids are also the highest uh, people who are providing particular services and tests because they go hand in hand. The opioids are the kickback for the patient to agree to submit to other tests, nuclear stress tests, x-rays, injections, or sometimes no services at all, but just a signature saying that they receive those things. The opioids are the lubricant that makes the Medicare fraud go. The doctors want to use patients, exploit them, use them as commodities to bill Medicare for millions of dollars. And in exchange, they write a prescription. Person's only too eager to get it. And so they set up pill mills all around our state. We had one in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where I live, that prescribed over 1.5 billion doses of prescription pills profited by the, to the tune of $4.5 million, and many people would line up outside the door to get those pills. They came from out of state, passing by other pharmacies, because they knew that that was the place where they could get services that they couldn't get in other kinds of places. So it is these corrupt doctors, not the good doctors who are serving their patients, a very small percentage of doctors who are the ones who are putting these drugs on the streets. And let me tell you, in Michigan, we have changed some rules to try to limit the abuse. Things like you must have a bona fide relationship with a patient, or you, there are limits on what you can prescribe. Do you think that a doctor who is going to bill Medicare fraudulently cares very much about these rules? No, they create false records to show that they're complying with these other things. They'll see a patient, that's all you have to do to establish a bona fide relationship. And so they're violating all these others, which are preventing legitimate caregivers from treating their patients, but it isn't stopping the 
corrupt doctors from pushing more drugs on the streets. And so what happens? Um, these pill mills are fly by night. They come and go. What happens when they leave? That's when people turn to street drugs, street traffickers, and buy drugs, use drugs like heroin, which is laced with fentanyl. It is a cheaper additive that drug, drug traffickers use to spread the profits even further, which we know can lead to fatal overdoses. So those are two of the drivers. And the third driver, of course, is the manufacturers who know that these drugs have addictive properties and yet mislead the public about them. We have seen the Sackler family and Purdue Pharma in negotiations now for a $3 billion resolution of thousands of lawsuits. Great work here by the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston against Incense Therapeutics that convicted five executives for bribery and false representations about the addictive properties of some of its drugs. Those are the real drivers of the opioid epidemic, not the legitimate doctors who are helping their patients. So you can put your guilt away and let's focus our enforcement efforts on the real wrongdoers here. Thanks. Thank you. So we have now a different set of ideas about the challenges that we're facing. And if the mark of an adaptive challenge, as we sometimes call it, or a wicked problem, is that the challenge looks different to different stakeholders and different groups, I think we have a version of that here, looking through the eyes of both the criminal justice system, law enforcement, and through the important uh, way in which each of the panelists so far has talked about the importance of individual people and what those individual, uh, let's see, I'm getting a little, mic. my mic. Okay, let me try that. Oops, there it is, thank you. <laughs> okay. So we've, we talked about um, how individual people ha have played a critical role, but also about systems and interventions that can take place both through people and through systems. So what I'd like to do now is, make, uh, is ask a question of each of our panelists, and then we'll be able to take some questions from all of you. So to this systems and person challenge, let me ask Lieutenant Detective Glynn uh, a little about the work you've done in law enforcement with naloxone. How has the introduction of the naloxone programs changed the public's perception of the police? In, in what ways has, have you seen that? And, and a second question has been, what has it been like for you and your officers to transition from a more traditional enforcement role to actually seeing yourself as public health practitioners? Uh, two great questions. Uh, the first part is it's dramatically changed the perception of the public towards us. Uh, when the officer shows up now, they, they started calling us the Narcan cops. Uh, when the patrol officer would show up, uh, the backbone of this entire program is the patrol officer out on the street, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning or 8 o'clock in the morning uh, reversing an overdose. And the public began to see that. Initially, they were misinformed. And so weren't some of the officers. They thought they were going to be delivering a medication through a needle. And everybody went off the rocket. They, they went off the page because they, they thought, number one, officers were going to be needlessly stuck by that and who is going to authorize this. Then they realized it was a nasal spray. Once they did that, a lot of things calmed down and then the benefits of it, how it had no ill effects. It would only work on an opiate overdose. So those things all started to subside once we started to educate the public and then educate the officer. And once the officer was educated, they saw the value to it. And we started to take a look at the situation where mere possessionary charges were not going through the court system and this person was needlessly going into the system and not finding their way out of that circle because they were just reoffending, reoffending where they needed treatment. So the officers began to see that and it was, it was really enlightening for them. Then obviously it hit home. A few officers lost their children. A few firefighters within our city lost their children also. And it became much, much closer to the belt and they saw the effects, the officers see the immediate results of being able to deliver the naloxone on the, out on the street. When we're the first ones there, historically, we're, we're the first on the scene about 95% of the time, then the ambulance and the fire department comes. Again, nothing against their response times, it's just geographics, it's, it's traffic, it's issues with weather and so forth. Uh, so that was a, a great change for them, and they really transitioned very, very well. And the second part of the question, just repeat one, one portion, please. Tell us a little bit about 
the experience of you and your officers as you moved from a traditional oh, law okay. enforcement role into being a public health practitioner? It was just smooth transition. I like to say there's always some speed bumps. Some people call them obstacles. But a speed bump, if you go over it enough times, it smooths right out. And, and that's what it was. I, I know I use you know, crazy analogies. But if you look at it from that way, you can see that. The officers are going back. Then we had the area of the frustration level of going back in repeat reversals for the same individual, same individual. And that's when they started to come up with home visits. We, we instituted that program to give more uh, counseling and more information for everyone to heal everyone together. And it's, it's just second nature. They know when enforcement is, is available and they know when the other side of what their job is. 90% of our job is service orientated for the public. It, it's not enforcing laws. It's not fighting crime. It's taking care of people. We're in the business of saving lives and helping people. And the officers saw that. And the public saw that at the same time. And within our city, it started to spread throughout the county, throughout the state, and throughout the country. The program that started in Quincy was a great help with uh, Director Michael Botticelli, who was able to help us through that. There were a lot of hurdles of laws and so forth. We were a pilot program. We were able to get over that hurdle. The Good, uh, Good Samaritan Law was amended back in 2012, which eliminated possessionary charges for a small quantity of drugs, basically a personal amount. That opened the floodgates for 911 calls. People were no longer afraid to call us when they needed help. Before, they would not call. We would show up at a scene and someone would be deceased with their license in their hand, and the place was sanitized, just as if someone came in and cleaned the entire home or the apartment. That doesn't happen anymore. We're getting the 911 calls. We're getting the resources to them. We're helping them, getting them to the hospital. And all we ask them to do is continue through with treatment and so forth. So it was a dramatic change. Mr. Langus, uh, you've told us an extraordinary story about your life and career and a way in which, as an individual working with others outside of the system, your work has transitioned to creating organizations from the ground up that influence state and other policy. What has it been like for you to move from working outside of systems and organizations to now collaborating more directly with law enforcement and other policy officials? Well, I think it takes a community. It does really take a community. And when um, I first started to work with um, law enforcement uh, some years back, um, you know, we had to iron out a lot of things, you know, personal things. I mean, I've, you know, sat in rooms where I had an officer sitting at the table that's arrested me. Uh, I've, had, I've been sitting in a room that the grandson of the first officer, the, the officer that arrested me was sitting at the table like he's an officer now. And um, <clears throat> again, I noticed the similarities between, you know, we all, want to, we all want to reach these goals of where we have, you know, healthy individuals, healthy families, healthy communities. And um, that's what we all want. You know, and being um, that I've been doing this uh, research for a while, you know, I, I've accumulated some things, like uh, I've accumulated like seven grandchildren. You know what? It would upset me to have them come home and tell me that they're watching somebody, you know, do some dope in their car, you know, like, or overdose in their car. You know, like, I, that's, like, I want a healthy community. The same as, the same as, like, you know, the person sitting next to me in, in, in this, uh, this coalition meeting, you know, and um, it's been really uh, rewarding for me really rewarding you know like I'm able to interact with um, several offices and it's always different it's different in every community you know um, and and they go through some heavy stuff that's stuff that I didn't look at before I didn't look at the trauma that they experienced you know it had to be you know conveyed to me that like you know we started to talk we're friends now you know do we agree on everything no no but the things we don't, you know, like that we have in common, we can come to a point. I know you want to. Let me ask you another question from your work in harm reduction, a, a more specific question yeah. about some of the supervised consumption sites. Yeah. What would you like those who haven't been a part of the harm reduction movement to appreciate about those sites? What, what is your view of them, and what do you want the general public to understand? Well, I think you could guess my view. But 
Um, you know, the way I look at it, I, I can remember um, back in 2005, there was a gentleman that overdosed on the Boston Common, and the only response he got from his overdose was to have his picture taken by a, uh, by a Boston newspaper and plastered on the front page. And as you, you know, they, they showed him like, you know, as he was high, you know, he died. He died. That was that's the wrong way to respond to an overdose, you know. Um, my my um, family and friends come to Massachusetts to to be you know to, to tour and enjoy the the scenery and walk through the the Boston Gardens and the Public Gardens and the Boston Common. You know they they love that stuff, right? And um, it sort of puts a damper on the day when they have to when they encounter somebody that's overdosing or somebody that's shooting dope out in in, in the park. Um, you know, I look at it that way. I know the benefits for drug persons who use drugs, and I'm sure, like you know, people in harm reduction and in this movement can explain that. But like, I'm talking about like that's our options. Do you want to have? This is the way it's been going on forever, too. It this isn't anything new. People have been, you know, you have to hide to shoot your dope. You have to go in the the, the, the bathrooms of Dunkin' Donuts, McDonald's. Um, and it's just dangerous for the community, right? So, like, that's, you know, I look at it as, like, you know, what, how do we have a healthy community? We engage with these folks. We engage with people who are using drugs. We have a place for them to go, okay? Is it ideal? No. No, if it was ideal, like, we'd have heroin assistant treatment programs. Or, you know, like, or nobody would do drugs. But that's not the reality of it. The reality is... You know, like people are out there uh, getting diseases, spreading diseases, dying like on, a, on a, a rate that's like unbelievable. Like if as many people died from having drinking a cocktail like out of an infected glass, you know, we wouldn't make glasses anymore. But um, it's, it's um, you know, I really um, support uh, supervised consumption facilities. Uh, you know, I just sat on the governor's commission uh, this past winter making the recommendations to open up a couple of pilot sites. And that person, that same person, like when I used to run programs, people used to come in and, um, and nod in my, my office. That's cool, because like in the past, if you come into a treatment organization or any kind of place, they say, listen, you don't come in here like this, or stop doing drugs and then come back and we can help you. Really? Like, if I had it like that, I wouldn't be here in the first place. Do you, do you know what I mean? So it's engagement, giving somebody a safe place, I mean, it used to be my office floor. People used to nap on it, right? And, um, and with these um, supervised consumption facilities, we have clinical settings where people can come in, do their, do their um, dose of drugs, and, um, and be supervised. There's never been a, a fatal overdose any place in a supervised consumption site in the world that's happened on site. So that's a great place for us to look at uh, innovations that both you and uh, Lieutenant uh, Glenn have already put in place to being able to move now to looking at maybe forward innovations. And I can turn to our other panelists. If I could ask both of you the same question, I'd love to see how you could respond to opportunities that you see either at the federal level or in some of your work in uh, law, uh, the, the connections between uh, legal, the legal system and law enforcement and so forth with um, Where's the innovation? What are the next possible things that we could do at the federal level in order to make uh, an affirmative impact uh, in the opioid response? And what are some of the opportunities you see in your work uh, at Northeastern that you could bring that to, to our, our attention? Yeah. Okay, sure. So I think that there's lots, um, lots of opportunities that have essentially gone, uh, have been ignored. On a federal level, uh, one key one since this conference is focused on treatment, uh, we need to talk about the fact that substance use treatment, specifically opioid agonist treatment, lives in a separate and unequal world uh, in the sense that you know, uh, buprenorphine and methadone are essentially singled out. Um, you know, stigma, part of the definition of stigma is singling somebody out and, and considering somebody the other. We consider medications for opioid use disorder treatment as the other. The rules that govern methadone especially and, and buprenorphine are uh, based on nothing but stigma. 
Um, they're not based on research. They're, they were never you know, evidence-driven, and I think um, uh, Dr. Wakeman and I and, and our colleague uh, Kevin Fichella wrote a piece about um, Xing the X waiver, you know, the fact that the, the waiver for uh, prescribing buprenorphine for addiction, not for pain, but for addiction, um, is, a, is a, a needless barrier. Um, certainly people need more education uh, on, on uh, prescribing, uh, uh, you know, sort of making people better stewards of opioids, and that's needed, but there's no reason to single out this particular medication. With buprenorphine, uh, with methadone, the situation is, is actually quite, um, uh, quite a bit worse. Uh, this is, we, we've created a separate and unequal system of clinics for methadone. There's lots of barriers to setting up those clinics. Um, the DEA has placed a moratorium on mobile methadone clinics, which makes absolutely no sense in the context of a lot of treatment deserts uh, throughout this state and, and throughout the country. So I think that there's lots and lots of um, minor technical fixes that should have been implemented a long time ago. And in fact, you know, we're in the third decade now of this crisis and we're still talking about these minor fixes. But I think a broader a framework and a, a broader sort of vision is that we need major uh, rethinking of our drug control regime from, a, from a, you know, the standpoint of the Controlled Substances Act, which is supposed to um, sort of uh, create control but also access for, for medication and for um, research. We failed on both sides of the equation in the sense that we have uh, overutilization of controlled substances in the, in the healthcare arena, and it's not just opioids. Uh, benzodiazepines, amphetamines are used at rates that really rival, um, are, are, you know, top, top of the world rankings, and we overutilize those medications. And on the, on the sort of the criminal justice side, the illicit side, we clearly have failed as well. So we really need to um, rethink how we manage uh, psychoactive substances and, you know, not even talking about sort of cannabis and psilocybin and MDMA, which are classified with the Controlled Substances Act um, in the same schedule as heroin, which makes absolutely no sense. Professor McQuaid? Yeah, I, I'd say uh, two things that can be used effectively. I think one is an increased use of drug courts. They've been very successful in Michigan. You know, I know we want to talk about decoupling uh, criminal justice and people who are using opioids, uh, but the fact is that oftentimes people commit crimes to support their habit, and so if there's a home invasion or a car break-in, people are going to be charged with a crime. But um, drug diversion courts can, instead of putting them in a custodial situation, put them in a treatment situation where they can solve their problem and avoid recidivism. So uh, that's number one. The other is sometimes people who use uh, opioids do end up in jails, and in jails they're not getting the treatment that they need. There's some folks here from... Um, the uh, Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan who are working on this problem in Michigan and trying to help jails uh, provide treatment for um, people who are inmates there. And one of the obstacles to success is their fear of diversion. If they are in the business of uh, dispensing drugs, the concern is what happens if some employee uh, steals the drugs or sells them on the street. And so perhaps grant opportunities to help them develop compliance programs without tapping into their already stretched resources could be a way of getting treatment for people who end up in jail. So as promised, we want to turn this now over and, uh, to you to open up the conversation. So if you have a question or a comment, please come to the mic. What we'll do is take one or two of those and then uh, I'll invite the panelists to respond, and then we'll take a, another one or two. Please. I think this is set for somebody who's 12 feet tall. Okay. I can't tell if it's on. Is it on? I have a little bit of cold. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I want to say thank you please, so much. Please let us know who you are. Oh, my name is Kathy Keegan, and I'm a community activist from Somerville. Um, I would love to hear more community voices at these kind of forums, but I, I want to really thank our international um, colleague from France, um, I think we do get a very myopic view. Um, and I think, why I have one comment and one question. The comment is that I, I feel really strongly that there's a lot of really brilliant, passionate, well-intentioned white people in public health. And we have to really ground ourselves and read our history, our American history, because our healthcare system is really based on racism. Um, and the 1619 Project, which I don't know if people have heard of that, 
come out of the New York Times, they have a whole section on health, which talks about things like um, so-called medical experiments that were permutated as, I can't even say the word science at the time, to say that people with dark skin didn't feel pain. They did experiments, they did things without anesthesia, and that's part of our medical background that we need to know. So my question is, relating to the international perspective, why aren't we talking about Portugal? Because they are the one country that I know of that has actually implemented system-wide changes to make this not a criminal problem, but a public health and a health problem. And they talked about stigma in ways that, again, it relates back to the racism, like we are talking about this in this forum at Harvard because it's affecting white people. But what they said in Portugal was that everybody knew somebody. So that's what decreased the stigma. It was somebody in your family, it was somebody at work, it was somebody that you knew that was using op opioids. And so that gave them the social will to change their system. Um, and they have really good data, so how come we're not talking about that? And if anyone else is going to take a trip there, a public health trip, I would really like to go. Okay. Mm. All right, thank you. May we get a, another question, please? Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Bridgette Davis. I'm a doctoral student at the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, I appreciate this woman's comment and also the diverse perspectives on this panel. Um, I wanted to mention, this is kind of more of a comment, I'm sorry, I know people hate that, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the death toll associated with the opioid epidemic. Um, we know that it's not just overdose, we know that it's um, bloodborne illnesses as um, our uh, speaker earlier spoke of, but also police kill people who are addicted all the time. My mother was a widow at 28 when a police drowned her husband in a puddle after he stole something for less than $50 to support his addiction. Um, and there's very good reasons why people are not excited or engaged around police being the people who provide um, harm reduction because in many like, instances, they actually are the, provide the most harm that can happen. So if, if we can talk a little bit about the reality of what it means to encounter um, individuals who don't necessarily understand and also pack a lot of um, stigma and racism into this, into this space. Um, and also the trauma associated with not just the individuals who have experienced that, but the families. Um, my sisters grew up without a father because of his addiction and the, who knows, maybe he would have been alive today if he was allowed to um, heal versus being killed, so thank you. Thank you very much for, for sharing your story and for raising these critical questions to let us know how deep the challenges go and the way in which uh, innovations may not be perceived as welcoming, um, even though uh, very good thinking is behind them. We'll, we'll get to that in just a moment. Let me take one more question, and then we'll turn it back to the panel. My name is Thomas Oyoung. I'm an Episcopal priest from Philadelphia. Uh, came up here uh, specifically for this conference um, because I need to, I want to, I'm on a crash course to learn about this problem because uh, at least three families that I know of in my congregation have um, been struck by tragedy and I want to find a way to um, uh, um, challenge the congregation to turn their grief into ministry or action or resistance to this problem. I have two questions which I hope will have brief answers, but before I do that, I, I would like to address um, the eminent person, a guest from France, and what he said, which got a nice laugh from y'all, uh, about Christianity and um, Judeo-Christianity and our um, concept of suffering. We do talk a lot about suffering. Our major figure did suffer and die on the cross. I don't believe that he did that so that we could all extol suffering and want to perpetuate it. I think he did it for the opposite reason. And we talk about suffering, but we also talk about hope and love and justice. And I I've been so appreciative of everything that's gone on, especially um, Professor McQuaid. You've been, you released a tension that I've been feeling all, all day about who the real purveyors of the evil. We also talk about good and evil um, in the church. <laughs> um, the purveyors of evil that are destroying our loved ones and our communities. So my two questions then are probably best addressed by Lieutenant Detective Glenn. Um, and one, one you've already brought up as a panel, it's the, in the safe injection sites. We're in Philadelphia, we're tearing ourselves apart over having one in the very troubled 
neighborhood of Kensington. I gather from what I heard from the panel that it's a no-brainer that these are good things. I'm wondering what we're doing wrong in Philadelphia that we're just debating about it and, and um, arguing. The other is, um, the question is uh, simply out of curiosity, the mother of one of the young adults who died about a year and a half ago uh, mentioned to me, and I didn't follow up with her, that, so this is the white family, it's a largely white church that I serve, um, that she was told by somebody, and I didn't follow up, that the dealers have different packets for black people and white people. I don't know if that's true, whether it's simply hearsay. If it is, if any of you have had experience with that, I'd, I'd um, appreciate some enlightenment. Thank you. So we have a very broad array of questions and comments and an invitation, really, for the panel to reflect. Uh, we have a specific question about the safe injection uh, or um, supervised consumption sites. Uh, but I think the larger question is really um, about the, if you might reflect on the larger context in which the uh, opioid response also touches on families and communities. And that even when we have wonderful model programs like Quincy, there still is a question in other communities where they feel that maybe they can't accept that innovation. And I wonder if you can say more about that, all, any of you. Sure. Uh, just back to the packages. The only difference in the packages I've seen are the prices. Uh, it all contains the same thing. It's not separated. Also, when we respond, we don't ask the color of someone's skin. We ask what the problem is. We respond and handle the situation from a medical standpoint. As I said earlier, we're in the business of saving lives and helping people. It doesn't matter where they come from, what language they speak, or what color they are. Uh, secondly, is, as far as the safe injection sites, uh, we don't have them here philosophically. Uh, law enforcement obviously will follow what the law is and we'll, we'll go with that. I, I like Gary's story about that. I mean, he's a very innovative individual who was in the forefront before they were even mentioned, really. That was the stuff that was taboo that no one wanted to talk about. And I think it's very admirable to come on and, and speak your piece on that. Would anyone else like to respond? Um, yeah, I'll just, uh, to, to the point of um, our faith-based uh, leader from Philadelphia, I think there could be little more than, that is uh, as Christian as harm reduction in terms of meeting people where they're at and helping people along the way. And I think that um, the voice of faith-based leaders in this conversation has been missing, and a lot of times... Um, uh, Christian leaders have actually spoken out against harm reduction as kind of enabling or promoting uh, problematic substance use, and I find that puzzling. I think it's, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not Christian myself, but it seems to align very well with Christian values. Um, as far as the, the tension between um, the law and um, safe consumption facilities or other innovations um, that we know have worked elsewhere and to bring them into the US context. Um, I'll make two points. One is that innovation in health, uh, especially uh, when it comes to harm reduction, has always come to the, from the ground up. Um, all of those wonderful things that Commissioner Burrell mentioned were initially initiated by people like Gary who were activists and who were engaging in civil disobedience for many years and going to jail sometimes for that. And so um, and that's how progress has been made elsewhere as well, where um, the law stood in the way, um, but people persisted, and eventually the law was changed because they persisted. Um, so I think, um, you know, the idea that we need to change the law in order to proceed with public health innovation actually is not reflective of the lessons of history. Um, and in the context of the safe consumption facilities, we're talking about enforcement discretion um, in the same way that, that uh, federal uh, law enforcement practices enforcement discretion when it comes to cannabis, which is now just a fact of life in uh, many states, the majority of U.S. jurisdictions, um, the same laws would be broken if a safe consumption facility came into, into the world. And yet the law enforcement, um, the federal law enforcement takes the view that, you know, in one case they're going to essentially look the other way, and in the other case, they're going to use the full power uh, you know, of federal law to come after something that is shown to be life-saving. So that's, 
um, just a clear indication of that the fact that law enforcement does make law and does make policy and that we need to really um, apply um, pressure on, on those law enforcement agents to essentially um, take life-saving as our, as our biggest imperative. Well, I, I think that the, the question, especially speaking about um, you know, the religious origins of some of these problems, is uh, a much deeper question, which is why do people become addicted to drugs in the first place? I think there is a feeling of hopelessness in our country caused by a number of things, including the head-spinning pace of technology, um, those who so uh, distrust and uh, hatred in people who are different from us and an other, um, a sense of if uh, you have problems, there's someone else to blame, and other kinds of things that cause people to feel hopeless and turn to things like drugs. I think we yearn for real leadership that will help us um, uh, come together to solve our problems as opposed to dividing us to expose our differences. So in bringing things to a close, I just want to acknowledge again the comment that was made from the floor around uh, officer-involved deaths in communities because I know it, it reminds all of us that the professional roles that we have and the innovation that we sponsor can be perceived very differently. We certainly know that in the healthcare world, that we may intend to be offering beneficial intervention, and it's viewed very differently on the basis of history. I think what we've seen here today is a conversation about innovation that can be realized, uh, change that can take place, but that it takes a long arc of time, and it takes a lot of creative people coming together and being willing to hear one another out. So I thank all of you for joining us today, and I thank you for the questions from the audience. Thank you to our panelists and moderator. We are now going to take a very short break. We will resume with panel three at 2.45. Again, 2.45, we will start panel three. Thank you.